let me just, let me just encourage you. Um, Holy Spirit, I'm sitting there minding my own business. And uh, Holy Spirit says, how many, how many go in Israel? And I said, 59. He said, go there. So I know. Psalm 59. He said, last two. So I go to the last two verses. This is what it says. But as for me, I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing a lot of your grace. For you are my fortress, a refuge when I'm in trouble. My strength, I will sing praises to you. For God is my fortress, God who gives me grace. This is the, this is the thought here. It's, it's looking prophetically. And the morning is coming for all of us, all God's people. And, and, and when all our enemies will be gone. And when the power and love of the Savior will be the theme of our endless song. Can you imagine? What a... And you know, I, I, I know some of you will be with family tomorrow, and, and some of you will be at church tomorrow, and that's great. But I just want you to know something. You, you can't get to tomorrow before you go to the cross. You know that, right? And I, I just, I don't understand why we don't celebrate Passover or, or Good Friday, whatever you want to call it, whatever, you know, whatever you want to call it. But should, you can't get there before you get to here, right? And so, uh, you know, that's fun. Hallelujah, right? The tomb is empty. But the tomb is only empty because somebody went into the tomb, right? So... Uh, let us, let us not forget. And that's probably why God wants us to celebrate the feast, so we don't forget. I mean, I, listen, I don't have the answers, which probably means you don't have the answers, so why don't we just defer to God? He's the Lord, the His feast. Why, I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand what the fight is. I, I can't understand it. Wouldn't it be nice if we just got on the same page? You know what I mean? I mean, some of these, some of these things that we're doing, they've only been around a couple of hundred years I mean, why are we doing them? I mean, they didn't do them in the first century. I would think they would know best. Those are his original students, right? I mean, they got the original stuff, right? So why are we messing with it? I don't know. All right. Um, let me, let me um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, do we have lights? What you guys doing? Okay, so, um, no, not on me. I just... I, I want to see you. I, 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 it's not a concert hall. You know, today it's like you go to these places, right, and they're all black, and the band comes out, there's pyrotechnics. I think we've got to put out a movie that says God's not deaf. <laughs> I mean, I, I, re, I remember going to those places too. I was just really high, and I you know, used to see rock bands in the 70s, and it was, it was a great time, and I jumped up too, you know. Um, all right, so let me, let me tell you what's, what's going on. I sat in prayer about Passover, right? I've been here 15 years, and for, for 14 of those years, I've been teaching about Passover, um, why we do it, how we do it, and I feel like I'm fighting this Christian culture here, and I'm just tired of the fight. I don't want to fight anybody, okay? The only one I want to fight is, is the enemy, and, and the way I fight the enemy is by obeying the Lord. That's how I do it. So with that being said, I prayed and I asked the Lord, I don't want to speak to that one person who comes here, Lord, that doesn't get it at all and leave everybody else standing on the sidelines, which is what happens in church today. We're not growing people up because we keep giving the basic message and nobody's maturing. You're like, you're set in your faith because you haven't been challenged in your faith. You haven't been discipled. You got a disciple on your own almost, which is not right because church is a discipling station for believers. You don't fish inside a building. You go out and fish, and you get the people, and then you disciple them. That's Yeshua's method, and you are not going to compete with it. You're not going to change it. Okay, God doesn't change. His methodologies don't change. So he was like, I don't want you to do that this year. So we sent out links on past teachings. So if you have no idea of Passover, it's okay. I understand. Just go to those links. There's a plethora of teachings. You'll find out the bits and the bites about Passover. But there's many people here that aren't on a messianic diet. You know, diets don't work, right? How many people have ever been on a diet? Right. They don't work because you have to have a change of lifestyle. So some of you might be on a messianic diet, like, oh, I'll sprinkle a little Passover, I'll put on a little Talit. Most of you, though, most of you are on a messianic lifestyle. You've chosen to see yourself grafted in according to Romans 11. You're part of the commonwealth of Israel, which means you don't only have their promises, but you have their covenants, their patriarchs, and their Torah, and you've decided to try to live that way, right? Which I think is right. If nobody else wants to do that, that's kosher because that's not my business. That's not my business. My business is to do what God wants me to do and not to dictate what everybody else should do, okay? But most of you are here and living a messianic lifestyle, so I didn't want to put you on the sidelines or stunt your growth. So this is what I heard in prayer. I heard no basics, 
and I heard three words, good, better, and best. And the minute, you know, when you, when you, I'm not saying I know God well, but I'm saying after, you know, after, what is it, 30 years, I guess, almost, 29, 29 years. After 29 years of spending every day and all day with somebody, you, you get to know a little bit about them. And you don't have to talk a lot. A lot of times like this, times when I just look at Bernadette with a certain look and she knows exactly what I'm saying. There could be somebody around and she gives me a look and I know exactly what she's trying to tell me because we've spent 32 years together every day almost. Um, I know, it hasn't been easy for me, but <laughs> that's, that's, a whole, that's a whole nother story. That's, that's not, you want to talk about deliverance. <laughs> come, Lord Yeshua, come. But, um, okay, let's not, let's not go there. Let's not go there because that's not important today. That's, that's a situation that we have. It's not important. But... Uh, and I don't want to. I don't want to air my dirty laundry in front of you guys. Just pray for me. Just pray for me and understand what I have to deal with. Uh. Anyway. 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 Yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Look, today is Passover. It's it's very celebratory. You're supposed to lean and relax because you're free. You're free. You're free. So I just don't want you to be too maudlin today. Not today. Not today. Today's not going to be about that. Okay. Um. So I heard good, better, and best. And when the Lord speaks to me, even a word. It's like the Holy Spirit quickens me and then directs me somewhere. So this is, this is where I went. Now, how many people remember the Sears catalog? Sears is soon to be history, obviously. Uh, 25% of all malls will close this year and next year. 2018, 2019 will close due to our good friends like Amazon and people who don't want to go out and be around anybody anymore, right? We have, we have home gyms. We have home theaters. We have home offices. Does anybody realize that we don't want to talk to anybody anymore? And although we have social media, we're not connecting. We don't know how to communicate. You know what social media says? Hey, this is my opinion. If you don't like it, too bad. And I don't want to hear yours. That's not effective communication. You understand? So sadly enough, you're learning how to not communicate through social media. And, and do you realize that, that in every culture since the beginning of time, there was no such thing as adolescence? There was none. You were a child, and then you were an adult. And when did you become an adult? Thirteen. And only in, our, in our, shh, 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 only in our Western culture, only in our Western culture, in America, do we have something called adolescence. It started in the 50s and the 60s. We said, you're 13. You're not really a kid, but you're not an adult. And adolescence was from 13 to 18. American College of Sciences, you know what they say adolescence is today? In the year 2018? 11 to 30. <laughs> Don't be so surprised. Some of you have them. They're home. They're in your house. It's a sad state of affairs. I'm not here to, 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 I'm not here to, look, I'm not a pessimist. I don't know if you realize that. I'm not a pessimist. I can't stand pessimism. But ridiculous optimism sometimes is not realism. I'm a realist. You've got to, fa I deal with truth. The Bible is truth. How did I come to that conclusion? Because I studied its internal evidence. I studied its external evidence. I studied its bibliographical evidence. I studied its time span from original documents and manuscripts. I studied its scientific data. I studied extra biblical data and matter like history and archaeological findings and, and other things. So I authenticated its literary authentication, if you will. Okay? I would never say to somebody, hey, read the Bible. Why? Because it's the truth. Do you know what an ignoramus you sound like? Can somebody say to you, read the Quran because it's the truth? But by the same token, for you people that say it's written by men, you need to do your study. You need to stop speaking nonsense without doing the study. That's, that's on you, okay? And sadly enough, the reason why kids today are leaving the faith in droves when they go to college, it's not because the world's attractive. Nobody teaches apologetics. In church, there's no apologetics. So the kids come away and they're just like, hey, mom, I, you know, I was going with it for your sake, but how do I know God is real? How do I know Yeshua is real? How do I know the tomb's empty? How do I know it's legit? Because we don't teach apologetics anymore. We just do rah, rah, sis, boom, ba. New wave aftershave crap. Anyway, I said I was going to be, I said I wasn't going to go there. You made me go there. You made me go there. <laughs> yeah, you did. I'm putting it on you. Anyway, where were we? We were at the Sears catalog before you rudely interrupted me. Do you remember the Sears catalog? They always had products good, right? The first Sears catalog, what year? 1888. 
1888, and so they had good, which means it's satisfactory. It's going to work. Good is good. Is good. It's going to work. It's going to accomplish its goal. Better, it's a little high quality. It might last a little longer, okay? What's best? It's of the highest quality. So I heard good, better, and best, and this is where I went for good. Let's, let's take a look. In Philippians, and I don't have time to go over who the Philippians were, where was Paul when he wrote it, what was going on in Philippi, but you desperately need to know these things. You know I teach them all the time, otherwise you are going to misunderstand, and even giving you three verses is not putting it into context. So can you imagine for those of us that take one verse and try to understand the letter? Poison. You will misinterpret the scripture, not sometimes, every single time, bar none. And the crazy thing is, everybody that goes to a seminary knows that context is one of the five principles. Why don't they teach it? I have no idea. I have no idea why they learn things in seminary and then think of you as a kindergartner and you can't handle that kind of stuff. I don't want to make it too heavy. I don't want to make it too hard. I don't want to feel like they're in a school. I don't want to make it too long. This is insanity. Paul preached and a guy Eutychus fell out the window. For to me, life is Messiah and death is gain. Now, how many times have you read that? Who believes it besides Paul? It's crazy, right? Nobody wants to die. Doc, whatever you got to do. But, but this is what we say. So what we, what we really say and what we believe might be two different things, and I'm not here to, to talk about that. So let's move on. For to me, life is the Messiah and death is gain. But if by living on in the body, okay, that means right now. He's talking about you guys and me guys. Living in the body, okay? Living in the body, I can do fruitful work, then I don't know which to choose. I am caught in a dilemma. Paul's in a quandary. And by the way, Paul was just a guy, just like you and me. He's in a quandary. My desire, what I want to do is go off. I don't want to be here. Where we're just the opposite. All we want to do is be here. We don't have, we don't have like homes anymore. They're castles. They're castles. I'm caught in a dilemma. My desire is to go off and be with the Messiah. That is better by far. So he's talking about what is good. By the way, here in a nutshell, if you will, is Paul's philosophy on life. If you hold Paul in any high regard, then I think you would hold his philosophy on life in high regard. He did not live for fortune. He did not live for fame. And he did not live for pleasure. Sounds familiar? <laughs> the object of his life was to love, worship, and serve Yeshua. Period. Now, look, I, I want to tell you a few things. First of all, he had a crazy, crazy conversion, if you will. He met the Lord, and he was on the other side of the fence, diametrically opposed, killing Jewish people who believe in Yeshua. He went from, you know, went from one end of the spectrum to the other. When you go from one end of the spectrum to the other, you become radical. Sometimes when you're raised in the church and you don't have any premarital sex, you're not too radical because you're under this impression that you're, you, you're good. And that said, he knew how not good he was. He knew what he was delivered and saved from. He knew. So he was out of his mind nuts. Okay? Secondly, he didn't have a family. So you didn't have to take the kids to the doctor and soccer practice and braces and all that other crap that we got to deal with. Okay? I'm talking to you two. <laughs> I'll never hear the end of that. At least from one of them. Anyway. Anyway. So he, he, was, he was very focused. Okay? He also didn't have the distractions that we have today. Way too many distractions. Way, way too many. So I just, I just want to throw that in there so you don't feel like, you know, that should be the object of my life. But for all things considered, that should be the object of your life. I told my oldest one, I don't care what you do in life. I don't care if you become a personal trainer, if you become an engineer. Just be a believing personal trainer. Just be a believing engineer. You follow? Underwrite everything you do with the Lord. That's the objective. So that should be our objective to... to, to to love and worship and serve Yeshua. Does any, can anybody refute that? Is that in anybody's, you know, Nicene Creed or something, that we shouldn't do that? 
No, of course not. He wanted so badly for Yeshua to take over and live his life through him. If you look in John 14, basically what Yeshua is looking to do is borrow your body and house you with the Spirit of God. He just wants to take over. And if you let him, he will. If you let him, he will. You won't have to worry about what to say, when to say it, where to go. Man, he will work you like a remote-controlled car. He'll stick his hand up you, and you will be a puppet. That, that might have had some bad imagery. Okay, you got me. Speaking of that, may I tell you a personal story that I couldn't make up? May I? You got anywhere to go? Okay. You know I have a, a gazillion issues, and I don't speak about them, and I don't put them on the prayer request, not because I'm private, just because there's so much, it, it just gets out of, it, it would be silly. Well, last week, I had to go to something called a colorectal doctor. Why did somebody just go, woo? <laughs> I can see if I said I had to go to a roller, I had to go on a roller coaster, and then later you go, woo. You don't say woo when somebody says colorectal doctor unless, let me, let me work this side of the group. That's kind of crazy in and of itself, right? Guys, mark her, whoever she is. Um, so, you know, you know you're in the, when you go to a doctor's office, you're in the waiting room. And then they bring you into the smaller waiting room. You're still waiting. You don't see anybody. It's just smaller, so you feel like you're going to see somebody soon. And then now they don't even give you a tablecloth because that, that costs money. They give you a big napkin to put over you. A napkin. So the lady walks in, and of course, you know, you've got to spread yourself around. So uh, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the nurse practitioner. I'm the nurse practitioner. Okay, hi, how are you? And she says to me, um, so I get this question all the time. I love it, only in making. Where are you from? Nanu, Nanu, I am Mork from Ork. Where am I from? <laughs> America? Earth? You know what I'm saying, right? Where are you from? Like, what am I going to do to you? Am I going to pickpocket you because I'm from New York? Relax. <laughs> so I said, New York. And she goes, so what brings you here? And I said, well, you know, the Lord really brought me here. I'm sure you've heard that before, but this is undeniable. And she said, oh, are you, are you part of a ministry in town? I said, uh, yes, yes, you could say that. I try not to advertise the ministry, and I never talk about Beth Yeshua, ever. I talk about Yeshua. I don't lead them to Beth Yeshua. I lead them to Yeshua. Beth Yeshua isn't the issue. Yeshua is the issue. Okay? I don't tell them I'm rabbi because it's not important. You don't have to give them your little 501c3 card. So she says, are you part of a church? I said, well, you know, you could say that, sure. I said, uh, actually, it's a synagogue. She goes, is it Beth Yeshua? <laughs> Meanwhile, the whole time I'm sitting there with just a napkin on me. <laughs> and wait, this, you're not going to believe this. Trust me. You're going to think you're making this up. I wish I, wish I was. This is... So she goes, um... She goes, um, do you know the rabbi there? And I said, um, like the back of my hand. I said, we're basically two peas in a pod. Very close. And she goes, oh, because my best friend in, in the world watches him every Monday. That's a thing. And she adores him. She adores him. She doesn't go to the synagogue, but she adores him. And I said... Oh, well, that's good because, you know, the ministry there is to, to, to bless him. She goes, maybe you could tell him. And I said, well, you just did. <laughs> and she goes, you're the rabbi? And she goes, man, if it wasn't for HIPAA, I'd call her right now and tell her, tell her that the rabbi is sitting here with a napkin on him. <laughs> with absolutely no clothes. <laughs> and so at this point, she says, you know, I'm going to have to do an exam before the... I go, don't worry about it. It's all biology. I'm not embarrassed. I... You know, uh, so, so she starts to do her inspection, if you will. It's fairly invasive. And she says, um, you know, Rabbi, I just want you to know something. 
you, you probably have no idea how many people you've touched. And I said, and you know what? <laughs> I bet you have no idea how many people. <laughs> True story. True story. You know, I asked the Lord if I could tell that story, and he said, yeah, and I said, how is it going to work? And then the puppet thing, he made that happen. <laughs> All right. It's a feast day. It's a, it's a party day. I know some of you might not be partying, but when we get to the end of this, you're going to be hooting and hollering. You are. So here he is. Here's Paul. He just wants the man. He is just a one-thing person. He just wants to serve the Lord. He can't think of anything else. Nothing. Nothing else is on this guy's mind. He can't get God off his mind if he tried to. And he's in a quandary. He's in a quandary. You know, he's saying, look, if I stay here, I'm going to witness my head off. But truth be told, I just want you to know, I'd, I'd like to get out of here. Okay? And, and that, so, so staying here, being saved, staying here, and being salt and light is good. It's good, guys. It's really good. But there's better. Look at 2 Corinthians 5, 6, 8. And this is the better. Here, here Paul was talking about perseverance in, in to the people of Philippi. Here, he's talking about the future glory. He's trying to inspire. 1 Corinthians, he was kind of like giving them a hard time about some of the things they were doing. But, but here, he's not Rabbi Saul. He's Pastor Paul, and you see his heart, and now he's trying to encourage the people of Corinth about the future glory. So that's why I tell you context is crucial. So we are always confident. He's, he's, he's saying, don't waver. We know, we know it's fact. It's a fact because the Bible is truth. We know that so long as we are at home in the body, right here, that's what he's talking about, this condition, we are away from our home with the Lord, okay? For we live by trust, not by what we see. We are confident then, again, confident. He's letting them know they should be assured and would much prefer to leave our home in the body to get out of here and come home to be with the Lord. As long as we are on earth, we have to walk by faith. Now, I can give you a plethora of proof for the legitimacy and the validity of that literary document we call the Bible. I can. And there's others out there who could do a much better job than me. So the information is there. But with that being said, we are still walking by faith. Yeshua said, you guys see me. Thomas, you put your, your fingers in my palms, but blessed are those who don't see and yet believe. And he was talking about us. Yes, this is a faith walk, guys. And, and living our life based on trusting God for our future. Some of you believe it, but you don't. You're like, really? He's going to come in the air. He's going to take us out, put us away. Then the last part of the tribulation where he pours out the wrath. Then he comes back and restores the earth. He, millennial, he has a reign for a thousand years. And then the heavens and the earth are restored and no more tears. That's a, that's, a, you know, that's, a big, that's a big journey of faith right there. But if you study the Bible's authenticity, you can believe it. But make no mistake, you're walking by faith. And that's what's happening right here. That's why he says, if I go, it's better. The faith walk is good, but if I go, it's better. He's talking about here the state between death and the coming of Messiah. Now, I don't want to mess with your theology, but most people's fundamental evangelical Christian theology is off when it comes to death. You say grandma is dancing with Jesus. Grandma's body is in the grave. Go back there a year from now and dig it up. She's disembodied. It's a disembodied state. You don't want to be in a disembodied state. You want to get your new body. And I'm not talking about, you know, the Miami died for your beach body. I'm talking about that glorified body. We know Yeshua showed himself glorified. Elijah and Moses showed up. They recognized him. The witch at Endor, according to God's permission, brought back Samuel. David said, I'll see my son again. Yes, we're going to... Eden is going to be restored, guys. God is going to restore it according to the last three chapters of Revelation. So you don't want to be disembodied. Now that might bother you. Wait, what do you mean grandma's not dancing with? What do you mean, what do I mean? You're disembodied. 
The next time you go out dancing, leave your body at home and send your soul and see how well it dances. Yes, it is with the Lord. It is with the Lord. It's the state between death and the coming of Messiah, a disembodied state. Most people think when they get saved, they're done. You're just beginning. And then most people think when they die, they go to heaven. Heaven's coming. We didn't go to God. God came to us. Heaven is coming. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth. Why is he going to restore the earth if nobody's going to be there? What is this, this illogical thinking? Well, it's just what we've been taught. Well, why don't you read the Bible? It's a disembodied state, but one in which the spirit and the soul, we're tripartite. Spirit, soul, and body. The spirit and our soul, our decision maker, whatever that looks like, it doesn't have a body, so I don't know what it looks like, but they're consciously enjoying Yeshua's presence. So for your loved ones that were blood-bought, they are enjoying Yeshua's presence. But they don't want to stop there. Is it better? According to the scriptures, it's better. I'm not going to refute it. According to the scriptures, it's better. In fact, it's better by far. So we have good, we have better, but why are you settling for better? You don't settle for better with nothing else. You want the best food. You want the best car. You want the best clothes. You want the best school. With the Lord, you settle for better? Some are not even settling for good. That's a real shame. To think that there's people sitting in church week in, week out, and they're going to hell. Wow. That's crazy. That's just crazy. So, we see good, we see better. Let's take a look at best. First Corinthians, Paul is talking about the resurrection, which we are in that season, first fruits. He says, look, I'm going to tell you a secret. All the secrets are revealed after Yeshua ascended. The only secret that's left, which is not a secret, is that he's coming back. There's no more secrets. You could tell Perry Stone, there's no more secrets. It's attractive to people because people love secrets. They love secrets. Gnosticism, secret knowledge. I have secret knowledge. I heard something from the Lord that you don't know. It's elitism. There's pride involved in that. And people flock to that. Where's the ark? If I tell you where the ark is, is that going to change your life? Is that going to make you more obedient? Is that going to make you more holy? Will you be better to your wife and kids? Because if it is, I'll find where the ark is. But the fact is, it's not. It's not going to change your heart one iota. And people spend a lifetime on things of that nature. Look, I'll tell you a secret, Paul says. Not all of us will die, meaning some are going to be alive when Yeshua comes back. That's what he's saying. He's not saying all won't die because one out of one still dies, right? It's a fact. But we will all be changed. That's what you want. You don't want better. It's disembodied. It's better than this because this is, this is corrosive. This is decaying. You know, as we get older, I don't care how much pearl cream you buy. I don't care how many lifts you get. You're dying. And for those of you that get all the Botox and all that, I'm not coming against it, but what do you want to hear at your funeral? Man, she looks great. <laughs> Look at her there. She's never looked better. Not a wrinkle. <laughs> Such a shame she's dead. <laughs> not all of us will die. He's talking about the coming, the second coming. This is the greatest thing. This is why Satan doesn't want Jews to get saved. Because they have to say Baruch Haba. They're going to usher him in. They, they brought him the first time. They're bringing him the second time. That's why he wants to keep them blinded. That's why you have to provoke them to jealousy. That's why you've got to understand the letter of Romans and not stop at Romans 8. Continue into 9, 10, and 11. Not all of us will die, but we will all be changed. Hallelujah. Don't you want that change? We're changing, but this is going to be the change. You follow? Glorified. Good is justified. Better is sanctified. The best is glorified. It will take a moment just like that. What? Just like that. The blink of an eye at the final shofar when Yeshua blows in himself. For the shofar will sound and the dead will be raised to live forever. See? That's why if that was, if, if that was the great state, go to heaven and that's it, disembodied, then who needs this? You're going to get a new body. You're not kidding. The dead in Messiah will be raised to live forever, glorified. 
And we too, he's saying, if you're around, when he comes and you're alive, we too will be changed. But the dead first. For this material, which can decay, our bodies, must be clothed with imperishability. This which is mortal must be clothed with immortality. Guys, this is crazy. This is the consummation of our salvation. This is the final exodus. This is what we're all looking forward to. Any believer in the first century is looking forward to this. When we receive our glorified bodies at the coming of our Lord and Savior Yeshua, we will have everlasting, incorruptible purity. Did you hear what I said? No matter how hard you try, you will never be perfectly pure in this life. But we will have absolute, everlasting, incorruptible purity. In other words, no more will you have a sin nature to battle with. No more will you have to have to say, why, God? I'm trying so hard. Why am I doing things I know I shouldn't do? Why am I saying things I know I shouldn't say? And why don't I do the things I know I should do? What wretched man am I who will save me? He's coming to... To, to, he's coming <laughs> he's coming for the final salvation even Paul said this right in Romans 7 and he was a pretty good believer but even he had a sin issue so guess what when you see all the perfect people they're not perfect it's a facade and they're not kidding me and they're not kidding God some will be alive when the Messiah returns and some will not but either way this is simply the best it is the best. Now, I was good with that. I was fine with that. And that's where I was going to end. And the Lord said, son, relate it to Passover. Okay, so here goes. Here's the good. John 9, 24, 25. This is the man that was born blind, remember? And what did the disciple say to Yeshua, who was his closest crew? He said, what are you guys looking at? I know what you're looking at. Yeah, yeah, I know that. Give me that. <laughs> Yesterday, our, say, our Seder was maybe about 45, 50 minutes. When in my father's day, you started the Seder at 5.30. You didn't eat till 10. And you didn't move either. Yeah. You're getting off the hook easy, sweet pea. Hang on. <laughs> so he was born blind. And what did the disciples say? Who sinned, right? All of a sudden, every time something goes bad, who sinned? Him or his parents? What did Yeshua say? Neither. So, so not all hardship is from sin. That biblical philosophy goes out the window. It doesn't hold any water. You don't know why, so stop trying to figure it out. Just worry about your own business. You're not Messiah's cop. So they asked him, and what did he say? He said, look, man, I used to be blind, now I see. They can't deal with it. Why? Because it's Shabbat. Religious people are so messed up. They're so much more messed up than secular people. Secular people I can work with. Religious people, there's, there's no hope. They're so stuck, they're so miserable, you can't get through to them. And these were, the, these were the pastors of the day. These were the religious leaders of their day. Instead of having a party that this blind guy can now see, he was born blind. You know what I would have said if I was one of the religious leaders? I would have grabbed him and said, Shlomo, what does this guy look like to you for the first time? What was it like when you saw your mom's face? What was it like when your little sister took you to the market and all those people used to greet, you could tell who they were now? What does the grass look like to you? Instead, they're ready to crucify the guy because it was on Shabbat. What a better time to release somebody than on a day of rest. Amen. Imbecile. Imbecile. Religious imbecile. Turning everybody off to God. How you doing? So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and they said to him a second time, swear to God that you will tell the truth. Meaning we know you're lying. We know this man is a sinner. He answered, you know the guy's Jewish because he's sarcastic. Hey, he knows he's not a sinner. He called him a prophet. If you re read the whole story, really, read 
the whole chapter of John 9. It's an incredible, beautiful story. But he's not, he knew it wasn't a sin. He called him a prophet. Because this guy, even though he's blind, knows better that nobody could do something like that unless they have some connection with God. I mean, not all miracles are from God, grant you. But clearly, this guy had a life of going to synagogue, obeying Torah. Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. I don't know. He's messing with these guys. Then he really grills them, and he says, oh, do you want to, are you asking so much because you want to become one of his disciples? He's such a sarcastic New York Jew to me. I, I love, read the whole story, you'll see me in there. Tell the truth, they said. There's no way this guy healed you. He's a sinner. You know, give glory to God. Every time the religious leaders tried to discredit Yeshua, it ended up bringing him more glory. It's the divine boomerang. You can't curse what God has blessed, and you can't bless what God has cursed. Just ask Balaam. The man's testimony is beautiful. He didn't know much about Yeshua, granted. But what he did know, he ain't blind no more. And, and they couldn't refute that, could they? He's sinned. In fact, they said, we don't believe it's him. And his parents are like, it's him, moron. <laughs> it's the same with us, guys. The world will doubt us, and it's going to be worse. I know some of you live in Macon, and you go to Destin for a week, and that's your life. And you go to church on Wednesday night, and church on Sunday and Sunday night, and you go to Chick-fil-A, and it's always closed Sunday. But this is not America, and this is not the world. And you're living in your own private Idaho, and you need to get out. Hey, you go to church, you go to Bible study. You go to quiet practice, you need to get out and be salt and light and see what's really going on in the world. And you need to make a difference. Okay, the world will doubt us, it's going to get much worse. They will scoff us, it's going to get worse. They will sneer at us. But all I know is I was blind and now I see. <laughs> Stephen Hawking, the great antagonist to our faith, so sad, such a brilliant man, but sometimes brilliance gets in the way of logic. He said, believing in God is a fairy tale for people afraid of the dark. I say not believing in God is a fairy tale for people afraid of the light. Amen. What we're talking here is salvation, nothing more. Okay? Right here, what you're seeing in John 9 is salvation, or if you're theological, it's justification. Or, or positional righteousness. Position for right, sitting in heavenly places with Yeshua. A right standing with God, if you will. That's all you see. By applying the blood of the lamb to the doorposts and lintel of your heart, by faith, we pass over from death into life. Hallelujah. We are delivered from the penalty of sin. We're not delivered from Torah. We're delivered from the penalty of not obeying Torah. Torah is good. It's holy, just, and good. We are delivered from the penalty the death sentence of not obeying it because we have a right standing with God. So we experience here the Passover that was. When you're saved, you're saved. It's time to grow up. It's time to go from good to better. You can't stay just saved. So many people, I see it. It's a phenomenon to me. In church cultures where once they get saved, they've arrived, they've finished. The race is complete. Now they just wait to die and go to heaven and play a harp. You just got into the race. You just went through a door and entered the kingdom of God. You're just starting. You're starting your faith walk. How could it be ending when it's just starting? So let's move on from the good Passover and let's go to the better Passover. Again in Philippians, Paul writes, chapter 3, 13, 14. Brothers, he's speaking to the body of Messiah, not the world. Brothers, I for my part do not think of myself as having yet gotten hold of it. How could he... The great apostle Paul say, I haven't arrived, and you think you have. This is very confusing to me. And this isn't like he met Yeshua yesterday. This is 10 years into his faith walk. And he's done magnanimous things. He's in prison right now as he writes this. He's beaten every which way. Left for dead. 10 years. Stella walked like nobody, nobody can say what he said, imitate me. So where do you get off thinking you've arrived? Where do you get off thinking your theology is ironclad? Rabbi, I hear what you're saying, but I don't hear what you're saying. I know, I get it. I get it. It's all right. It doesn't bother me because it's not going to stop me from saying it. 
I'm not worried about who's receiving it. I'm just worried that I do my job. When I get out of here, Lord, did I, did I say what I was supposed to say? We're good, right? It's about me and God. Brothers, I for my part do not think of myself as yet getting hold of it. But one thing I do, indomitable. One thing people, they're psychopaths. You know people that want to play professional sports? Man, they go for it. Or people that want to climb the ladder of fame in a corporate environment? They go for it. This guy's going for it. If anybody else goes for it and they send out YouTube videos, look at this guy's workout. It's unbelievable what he's willing to do. And we applaud him. But when we go for it in the religious community, oh, that guy's weird. Even religious people say that. What's so weird? You're weird, little freak. Listen, <laughs> one thing I do, forgetting what is behind me. I'm not, I'm not, you don't walk like this, man. All you, so many of you living in the past. Oh, what I used to do. What I, I remember, I remember. Man, you're living in the past like Jethro Tull. Get on with it. Nobody puts their hand to the plowshare and get on with it. You got in it, now go, go forward. I, for my part, do not think, but one thing I do, not two things, one thing. He's a one thing guy. Forgetting what's behind me and straining. Is it going to be easy? Heck no. If your walk is easy, you ain't walking with my God. It's a strain. It's a war. It's a battle. It's a fight. But it's good. And it's right. It feels good. And it feels right. I fought a lot of fights, but this fight feels right. I strain forward towards what lies ahead. What's ahead? I keep pursuing, keep pressing. What goal are you talking about? To win the prize. What prize? I'm saved. He who endures to the end will be saved. So says Yeshua, Matthew 24, 12. He who endures to the end. It's a race. And you've got to finish that race. The man who is content with whatever material things he had. This man who was content with whatever he had materially was not content with his spiritual attainments. Or his overall spiritual position. He felt he hadn't arrived, so what does he do? He threw his old life behind him. Done. I don't want to talk about it. Not only his sins and his failures did he throw behind him, but his attainments and his successes. Shh, not interested. All dung. And he pressed on to the finish line of God's race, the judgment seat of Messiah. In order to win the prize, the crown of righteousness, the fullness and blessings and rewards in the age to come. It wasn't about this life. It was about that life. And so many, it's all about this life. What are we talking here? Justification? No. Salvation? No. Delivered from the penalty of sin? No. The Passover that was? No. We're talking practical righteousness or growing in God by becoming transformed from the world and its godless system. Being delivered from the power of sin, not just the penalty. The power. How could that be, Rabbi? It could be by the power of the Holy Spirit. It could be many of you can testify things you were doing that you're not doing. Things you used to do that you're not doing. Things that you wouldn't even think about doing that you're doing. My dream was to retire at 30. I was on a very fast track in the business world. Retire at 30, absolutely not be married with no kids, and have nothing to do with God. How am I doing? <laughs> Thanks. That's on you. Now I'm talking to you. This is the Passover that is. This is the Passover that's happening for us. Every time we say no and yield to the Holy Spirit, God passes over us and hovers and treats us like we're in his refuge and the angel of death can't touch us. He eclipses the devil every time. This is what's happening for us right now as we speak. But is that the best? No. Mm -mm. This is the best. Psalm 27, 4. Just one thing. There it is again. John 9, he said, just one thing. I was blind, now I see. Philippians 3, just one thing. I press on to reach the goal, to win the prize of the high calling of Messiah Yeshua. Here we go. The best is still one thing. Just one thing. Have I asked of Adonai? Only this will I seek. This is all I want to do. To live in the house of the Lord. All the days of my life to see the beauty of Adonai and visit in this temple. That's the best. Yeah. 
David doesn't just want heaven, but he wants the king of heaven. Why? Because he's beautiful. Because he's beautiful. And there's something so special about these one thing people. They want what they want. They know what they want, and they go for it. And whenever we do this in the world, we applaud them, and we should, because it shows an incredible tenacity, an incredible work ethic, an indomitable spirit. Why not in the spirit? All I'm saying is, I'm not saying don't do that. I'm not saying be a bum. I'm not saying that. Go for it. But why not go for it in the spiritual realm as well? Why is that a no-no? Delivered this, we're delivered from the penalty of sin, delivered from the power of sin now, then we'll be delivered from the very presence of sin. Glory land. And this, my friends, is the best. This is the best. Oh. Let me, let me do something really quick. Do you mind? I, I just want to interject something. Can you throw up Luke 10 there for a minute? I love you. I do. When, when something good happens for you, I'm really happy. I really am. Whatever that is. Somebody came and told me they got a, a new job and the guy was struggling a little bit and I was so happy. And they're going to be able to move closer. I was so happy. I came home. I told Bern I'm so happy. When anything goes for you good, I'm happy. And when anything goes for you bad, I'm really sad. I'm not one of those guys who say, maybe, maybe they did something to me. What? That's crazy thinking. That's almost demonic thinking. Maybe they did something, maybe they didn't. But can't you be sad for their sadness nevertheless? <laughs> What's the difference if it was a sin issue? They're still hurting. What is wrong with... Anyway... Let me just give you some friendly advice, okay? You know, this is Yeshua's friends, his buddies. Whenever he's around going into Jerusalem, he always stops at Bethany. You know what I mean? It's like when people sometimes come down and they go into Florida and they live in Ohio or something, come 75 and they watch, they stop here. Okay, these were his buds, Mary and Martha. You know the story, but the sad part is I don't think we apply the story, okay? On their way, Yeshua and his Talmudin, his disciples, they come to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into a home, of course. Buds, oh, it's Yeshua, Mary, it's Yeshua. She had a sister called Miriam who also sat at the Lord's feet and heard what he had to say. Martha was busy with all the work to be done, so going up to him, she said, Sir, don't you care that my sister has been leaving me to do all the work by myself? I know we at least got one Martha in here. However, the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, whenever he repeats, he's Peter, Peter. He's always making a big point for all of us. You are fretting and worrying about so many things, but there is only one thing that is essential. Miriam has chosen the right thing. It won't be taken from her, meaning not now or in eternity. Now, just listen to me real quick. First of all, do you know what a, a house looked like in the first century? It's not like your house. <laughs> okay, it was one room. The animals were on a lower level, connected. Maybe a baby was in a hammock. You had a little kitchen area and a sitting area and a place to sleep. One room. So it's not like she was in the kitchen, right, and you were downstairs in the family room. <laughs> or you were upstairs in, in the movie room. Or the sewing room. You know how there's so many rooms now. My God. What? Crazy. But anyway, anyway, so she's right there. I, I, I think you need to know this because Mary is sitting at his feet, which, by the way, by the way, again, this whole Bible is written by Jews, two Jews. So if you don't understand Jewish culture, you won't understand. But sitting at your teacher was, was being discipled. That's what they called it, sitting at the feet. If you read um, Acts 22.3, you'll see it. It says that Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. In fact, you were so close to your rabbi that it said you would, you would feel the dust from his sandals. You were walking so close to him. Okay? So sitting at the feet didn't necessarily mean she was actually sitting at the feet, although she might have. But sitting at the feet was more of a colloquialism. A Hebraic expression that meant, hey, my teacher's here. <laughs> Have at it, Martha. I'm, 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 this is what I'm doing. But Martha was, uh, you know, she was a lunatic. She always had to have everything right. The house had to be perfect. You know, the house was perfect, but the heart wasn't perfect. You know what I mean? The house was perfect. All the guests came and they go, oh, look at the great house. Meanwhile, you had no peace. And then finally when they said, oh, your house looks so beautiful, then you're like, oh, good. 
Now I'm a good person. Now I'm happy. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And so she thinks, hey, I got to make a meal, which was, which was a nice gesture. There's nothing wrong with what she was going to do. But she's hitting the dough and kneading the dough. And her little sister, probably about maybe, maybe Mary was like, I don't know, 13, 14. They grew up quick. They got married by the time they were 14, 15. So they're teens, young. And she's hitting the dough. And Mary's just sitting there listening to Yeshua. And Martha's trying to listen in. But she's mad. And she's banging that dough. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. I don't know why you had to invite so many people. I'm so tired of everybody coming over to our house, and then they come, hey, how you doing? Shabbat Shalom. Right? And so she finally comes in and says, you know, she laces into him. She's like, it's your fault, man. Why don't you tell her to get up and help me? You see, and he doesn't say, you know, you're right, or Mary, Mary. She looks upset going there and help her out. Uh uh-uh. uh. He, he is a man of honesty and he is genuine, thoroughly genuine. And he's not going to placate anybody or manipulate anybody. He's going to be loving, but he's going to be forthright and honest in everything he does, whether people like it or not. And they obviously didn't like it because they killed him. So. It says Martha was busy. You look up that word, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, and it means she was overoccupied. It means too busy. Anybody too busy? I might be the only one. Praise God. I'm glad to hear that. I am too busy. I am too busy. And there's sometimes people ask me to do things, and I say I can't because there's no room on the plate. There's no room. I'm just too busy. With what? I'm too busy with work. You know, service and ministry. Too busy, too busy. And, and some of us are too busy not with work and ministry. We're busy with stuff, stuff. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like you're married to Google. I don't know who this Google is, but it's taking up a lot of our time. It's ridiculous, guys. I spoke to a bunch of pastors in Tennessee when I was up there the last time. They had a meeting on Monday, and they asked me to share. I don't know. They didn't ask me to share. The pastor who invited me asked me to share. And they weren't too crazy about what I said, but I said, don't sacrifice your intimacy with God on the altar of ministry. And I could say to you, don't sacrifice your intimacy with God on the altar of work or stuff. Okay, you're married to the Messiah, not to your ministry. It's a huge mistake. And and the wife that marries the pastor didn't marry the church. She married the man. It's a mistake. I... uh, I was going up to Memphis, and this is what I prayed to the Lord. Lord, I'm thoroughly exhausted. When I get up there, I know I'm going to have a meeting as soon as I get there, Saturday night, and then I'm going to have two meetings Sunday morning, and then they want me to talk to the youth Sunday afternoon, then they want me to talk to church Sunday night, then they want me to talk to pastors Monday morning, then talk to another group Monday afternoon, and then speak to the church again Monday night. And I leave here exhausted, so I just said, if it's possible can you not give me an opportunity to witness on the plane? I know that sounds really weak, but I feel, I don't want to say obligated. I just, it's just, you know, fish swim, birds. That's what I do. So I get on the plane. I'm sitting in the exit row. Two guys next to me. This guy goes right to sleep. Bam. I'm like, cool. (laughs) The other guy's like a good old boy. You know what I'm talking about? His phone case is camouflage. You know know what I'm talking about. (laughs) What's wrong? A bunch of people say, what's wrong with that? (laughs) <laughs> so is mine <laughs> so, uh, so he takes out his body I told you So he's a good old boy you know And I, he looked like a nice guy Probably going back to Tennessee Lives somewhere around there He takes out a Bible I just get excited When I see somebody take out a Bible I don't know about you But I'm like You know what I mean <laughs> Like remember when, when Charlie got the golden ticket In Willy Wonka <laughs> That's how I get When somebody took out a Bible So I'm, I'm trying It's really fine print And I'm looking over And looking over And looking over And I just want to see What he's reading like, it looked like he was reading Colossians. So I just wanted to, hey, do you know much about the, what was going on in Colossae? You know what I mean? I just, you know, maybe he, was a, maybe he was a Bible student. Maybe he was in Bible college. But anyway, he's got these big headphones on, you know, camouflage. And <laughs> finally, I couldn't take it anymore. I was exhausted. But I was like, hey. And he goes, 
I said, are you reading that for pleasure or, or for study? And he goes, I'm just reading it, okay? <laughs> and he puts right back on the headphones. And I'm like, wow. And so I said to the Lord, wow, can you believe this? He goes, what do you mean, can you believe this? You prayed. <laughs> Honest. She was worrying and fretting. She was anxious and disturbed, agitated and frustrated. Is anybody like me, I mean, this society has agitated me and frustrated me. Last week I had a call, a couple of big corporations, like I don't want to mention names, but like AT&T or APRI Healthcare or things of that nature. <laughs> how many prompts, how many prompts do you want it in English? Are you under this healthcare plan? Are, are you wearing boxer shorts or tidy whities I mean, how many prompts before I get somebody? And then I get shipped over to another country. I can't understand them. They can't help me. They're not being paid enough to really help, sadly enough. But we got to cut labor costs because we got to make more money. Money has buried our society. Buried our society. It's buried our families. It's buried our lives. We have more of everything, but we have so less of what's important. And then I finally get the person after waiting 38 minutes, and you get disconnected. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? And there's nothing you could do. So finally I get back, and no offense, you know, I love, I love my Filipino people, but this was the Philippines, and I finally got back. And they said, can I help you? And I said, look, I love Ponce, and I love Lumpy, I've got Filipino friends, but if I could take a flight to Manila right now, I'd take a flight and I'd choke the life out of you. <laughs> and Bernadette says, what are you getting so frustrated about? <laughs> There's nothing you could do about it. I go, well, well, I'm the one making the calls. <laughs> you get disconnected after holding for 38 minutes. And then I find out, I find out, I find out that they write in my little file, I'm irate. <laughs> like they're marking me. Like I'm the problem. Anxious, disturbed, agitated, frustrated, distressed, and upset. That was Martha, and that's a lot of us. Martha was doing a good thing, but Mary did a better thing. Martha was doing a good thing. Mary did a better thing. Because the greatest possession you can have, guys, is close fellowship with the Lord. There's, there's nothing like it. And the more you convert from a Martha to a Mary, the better off you'll be. Because you have to stay connected if you're going to be perfected. And, and sitting at the Lord's feet does not mean sit at the Lord's feet. It means attend to the word. Attend to the word. You have to speak to God about men before you speak to men about God. You can't give what you don't have. Now, let me end with a, an encouragement. Good, better, best as we fast forward to the final exodus. This is good. Revelation 19, 1, 7. After these things, I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd in heaven shouting, hallelujah, Yeshua is returning with the saints. He's coming. Hallelujah. This is what I call the big hallelujah party because, because the bridegroom is coming to marry his bride. The victory, right now we're engaged. It'll be consummated. The victory, the glory, the power of our God. For his judgments are true and just. He has judged the great whore, Babylon, the system, not the place, the world system, who corrupted the earth with her whoring. He has taken vengeance on her who has the blood of his servants on her hands. That's the wrath of God at the end of the tribulation. And a second time they said, hallelujah, because she's gone. The system's gone. Her smoke goes up forever and ever. The 24 elders and the four living beings fall down and worship God sitting on the throne and say, amen. Like, the truth has become true. Hallelujah. Let's continue. A voice went out from the throne saying, hallelujah, look what's going on here, man. We haven't heard a hallelujah since the Psalms. All you, his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what sounded like the roar of a huge crowd, like the sound of rushing waters, like the loud peals of thunder saying, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I don't know, the God of heaven's armies has begun his reign. You see, it's not about going to heaven. It's coming. 
and I, I mean this, my friend who's a pastor can't get this concept, and I don't know why. I just don't know why. It's scripture. I know he's been trained a certain way, but it's not the truth. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us give him the glory. I mean, wouldn't you rather be in an incorruptible body with your family and friends enjoying a perfect land than being a soul trying to play a harp? Let us give him the glory, for the time has come for the wedding of the Lamb, and his bride has prepared. We're in the preparation stage, getting rid of spots and wrinkles. Yeah, that's what's happening right now. We're getting ready. That's good. You ready for better? Next chapter, Revelation 20, two verses. Next, I saw an angel coming down from heaven who had the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil, Satan, the adversary, and chained him up for a thousand years. Hallelujah. I don't know about Alice in chains, but Satan's definitely going to be in chains. And the millennial reign of Yeshua is underway. This is better, by the way, during the millennial reign, you won't have Satan to blame. All right, let's get to best. There's a hush over the crowd. This is the best, guys. Revelation 21, 1 through 4. Yes. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. See? New earth. New earth. For the old heaven and the old earth had passed away. It's going to be renewed like the new moon. And the sea was no longer there. there. There will be a sea, but they're talking about calamity. Also, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem. See, it's coming down. See, we're not going up to it. It's right there. I don't know what they're missing, but whatever it is, there is. And I know some of you are like, I don't care what it says. I know what I believe. Good. Good. That's called cult-like thinking. It came out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. I heard a loud voice from the throne say, see? Exclamation point. Meaning, see? I told you. It's true. God's Shekhinah is with mankind. The glory of God is with man. And he will live with them, dwell, tabernacle. Then that feast of tabernacles will be complete when, he, when he's there for the millennial, but then we will have the Shabbat. Then we'll truly have a time of everlasting peace. This is Shabbat. All the feasts are fulfilled now. They will, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I don't know about you, but I shed a tear every day. There will be no longer be any death. I hate death. And there will no longer be any mourning, crying, or pain. Hard to imagine, right? You want to talk about I can only imagine? Man. Because the old order has passed away or passed over. We will enjoy intimate communion with the Lord closer than we ever dreamed possible. It is unfathomable. By the way, Kleenex Files chapter 11, and this is the best. Guys, stand with me while I give you three verses of just closing encouragement. Yeshua teaches in Matthew 24 and Luke 21 about how things are going to rapidly change and how things are going to get real bad. And most people read these things and they panic, so they make up a thing that they'll be taken out before it gets bad, and they make up this, this theory that Yeshua never taught, the disciples never taught, that wasn't taught till 1860, called the rapture. But he didn't say you're going to be pulled out. He said, protect them while they're here. In this world, you'll have tribulation. We won't see the wrath of God. That's undeniable. But the wrath and tribulation is different. But this is what he did say. He said, there will appear signs in the sun, in the moon, and the stars, and on earth. Nations will be in anxiety. Nations will be, whole nations will be in anxiety and fretting and worrying. You think you're worried now? Mm -mm, nothing. And bewilderment, confusion, at the sound of the surge of the sea as people faint with fear at the prospect of what is overtaking the world. For the powers in heaven will be shaken. We will be here. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with tremendous power and glory. Guys, I'm here to tell you that the best is yet to come for us. 
for us, we are lucky beggars. The best is yet to come. The final exodus is yet to come. We are yet to be liberated. So when you see these things, guys, no, things aren't falling apart. For the world, they're falling apart. For us, it's coming together. They're actually coming together. So when you see these things up on your feet, heads held high, you stand tall because Yeshua is on the way. Encourage each other with this. We need each other. Don't live in your private Idaho. We need to encourage each other with this truth because some people are really overwhelmed with what's going on in their lives and everybody has something going on. So you guys encourage each other. Don't beat each other up, especially not here. I can't dictate what goes on outside, but in these four walls, try to get along and play nice, okay? Now may the Lord bless you and keep you May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of all peace, Yeshua. Shalom. Chag Sameach, guys. Shabbat Shalom.